Well, thanks everybody for coming and we'll uh, get started here. All right, so as Sean was saying, this is basically a, a very similar presentation that I gave a few months ago when I um, defended my dissertation uh, for my doctoral studies at the University of Wyoming. Um, my topic was looking at um, students' perceptions or feelings of connectedness, specifically in online graduate business programs. So um, my brief overview, kind of the, the overall, uh, my mouse isn't working. I'll <laughs> back this up. Okay, so uh, just a brief, very brief overview of this study is that uh, I investigated student perceptions of connectedness, specifically in online, uh, two online graduate business programs. One was a, an MBA program, the other one was Masters of Science in Organizational Management. Uh, the study site uh, was here at Chatham State, um, and I used survey research, so I, I, this was kind of a, a survey that I uh, emailed to students and had them fill out. And uh, the tool that I used, or the instrument that I used to kind of uh, process the information was the online student connectedness survey. And uh, what that does is that um, basically gauges the student's level of connectedness. Okay? And the uh, people who developed this survey, w one of them was my uh, advisor and, uh, and a colleague of hers. So. One of the reasons why I chose this topic, one, because I found it um, interesting and relevant, and another reason is because the research in this area is very limited. There are just a tiny handful of, of studies that have been conducted uh, for online programs, specifically online graduate programs. Um, probably only, I think, four or five studies have been conducted in that area, and none of them have been in the specifically with uh, online graduate. Most of it's been either at the community college level or at the undergraduate level. So we're kind of wading into new territory with this study. Okay. So here are my research questions. Okay. What I'm looking at uh, specifically is what are their um, perceptions of connectedness in those two programs as measured by that uh, online student connectedness survey? And then I wanted to know if there were differences of, of this, um, differences of their perception of connectedness based on a few different factors, like their age, their gender, their program, and how many hours have they completed in the program? Are they first year graduate students or second year graduate students for the master's programs? Okay. I wanted to find out by asking the students what their uh, perceptions uh, were in regarding their instructor's integration of activities in their, in their online learning and what interactions, uh, what, what interactions would students like their instructors to take? Okay. So the, the theoretical foundations uh, that kind of underpin this study is we're looking at online learning, okay, specifically for adults. Okay, these are, we're, we're all graduate students, everybody that's enrolled in these uh, programs uh, either already have a bachelor's degree or are very close to uh, finishing if they're an undergrad, but just about all of them were, were uh, graduate uh, students. Okay. We're looking at formal and informal learning because we both can learn formally from you know, reading books, taking courses, stuff like that, and also informal learning, like you know, learning how to tie your shoes, learning how to interact with others, <laughs> uh, lifelong learning type, type things that are, uh, can be either in a formal or, or an informal setting. And then when we look at connectedness, it has four primary kind of pillars, basically. The first one is community. When we're talking about online courses and looking at connecting with other people, we want to build a community of learners. Okay? Now, you can have an online program that doesn't have any sense of community at all. It's just do these assignments, you know, you, your instructor grades them, and they issue a final grade at the end of the semester. Okay, that's more of like a correspondence type course, uh, just only in an online setting. But what we, what we wanna do in a, in a modern online course uh, is build a sense of community. Okay, people get to know each other a little bit as best they can at, with remote and asynchronous communication. Um, and also, uh, you know, have them interact with each other, either in the discussion forums or chats or wikis, there, there are all kinds of different tools you can use. But what we want to do is we want to build a sense of community. 
instead of just a, okay, I check in once a week, I do my assignment, I submit it, I, and then I come back or whatever. We want them interacting fairly often. Okay. Uh, the second pillar is comfort. Now with comfort, what this is, is you want to make sure that uh, the student is in a comfortable environment. Okay? They don't feel daunted by the technology or by um, not being able to understand the assignments, things like that. Okay? You want to structure the course in such a way that if it's the first time that I've ever taken an online course, I should be able to, with a minimal learning curve, should be able to come in and, and be comfortable in that learning environment. Okay? Um, facilitation. This, uh, this pillar basically what we're looking at with facilitation is we want to have instructors that are helpful, okay? They, they provide you regular feedback, provide a structured environment for you to work in. Uh, if you email them, they get back to you within a reasonable amount of time, okay? What we're doing is we're facilitating the learning. We're not just dumping a bunch of assignments on the students and saying, okay, well, you know, these are these five things you need to do this week and, and then never offer any feedback or advice or guidance, okay? A really good online program will have instructors in there that are very uh, communicative and very, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're there for their students, if that makes sense. And then the last one is collaboration and interaction. Okay? So not all, this, this is a little bit different than communities. In communities, we're, we, we're all kind of getting to know each other and stuff. Collaboration and interaction is more along the lines of we're working together for a common goal. Okay? So maybe a group project something like that where you know, everybody kind of goes boo at the group projects, but they're there for a reason. They're there basically for you to be able to work with other people like you will in the work environment after you've left college. Okay? Or if, if you're taking an online course, you're, there's a good chance you're probably already working and you have to work with other people, right? The same kind of thing in these online courses. What frequent interaction so people don't feel isolated. Okay? If you never interact with your peers, if you never interact with your uh, you know, with your instructor, it can feel very isolating and that can lead to, to students just dropping out you know, of the courses or out of college and we, we really don't want to do that. We want to be in an environment where we're encouraging them to uh, complete their degrees. Okay. Uh, my research design, I use survey research, so I just basically used a, a survey tool, uh, collected the data that way, students logged in and filled out the survey. What I did is I uh, sent an email invitation link to all of our currently enrolled MBA and MSOM students. <clears throat> and um, the, server, the, the uh, students who participated completed an online questionnaire which consisted of the scaled items from the OSCS instrument. I had a couple of open-ended questions in there and then I collected demographic information. Okay, pretty typical survey. Uh, finally, after, I, uh, after the, the survey window ended, I clean and coded the responses, and then finally um, did an analysis on, on the data once it's clean. Because sometimes you get, some people maybe don't answer all the questions or they, they have like all ones or all fives on a scale from one to five. So I had to throw a couple of, of uh, responses out based on that. But from the students who participated, I, um, uh, I did have a, a, a pretty good response rate. So all currently enrolled MSM, MSOM and MBA students were invited. That was uh, 273 of them. And to, uh, to encourage participation, I bought uh, uh, $300 worth of Amazon gift cards and, <laughs> and did a random drawing. So, all right. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there a little bit. So I uh, ended up with um, 115 responses. You can see in with my, um, I, in my, when I looked at demographics, I was looking at age. I just broke it up into age brackets based on every 10 years of students that were enrolled from you know, 20 to 30, 31 to 40, and so on and so forth. Uh, two genders, two programs, the MBA, MSOM. And then I asked for hours completed. Were they under 19 hours or over? Uh, 18 hours, okay? So um, from zero to 18 and 19 to 36, that's year one and year two if they're a full-time student. And then, um, then when I cleaned that up, I, again, I removed a few extreme outliers and a few invalid responses. All right. Uh, the instrument that I used, 
again, has, uh, it's the online student connectedness survey. And this, again, was developed to determine learners' perceptions of connectedness, specifically in online programs. There are a few different instruments that will do like uh, um, connectedness surveys for classrooms. There's one called the Classroom Connectedness Survey. This one's quite similar in that it, but it's specifically for online students. So we um, basically strip out anything that says like, you know, what is your interaction with your instructor in your classroom time? Well, we don't have classroom time, usually. All right, it's uh, 25 five-point Likert scale type questions, uh, four scales, and with the com comfort, community facilitation, collaboration, interaction, like I was saying earlier. Uh, I <clears throat> also had uh, multiple response items, uh, just asking what activities are instructors including in your online courses to foster connectedness. Um, in that one, it was just you know, your typical tools that most instructors would use in an online program, like discussion forums, group projects, uh, group assignments, things like that. You know, do they use messages, chat rooms, discussion forums, and so on and so forth. Uh, I had two open-ended questions. The first one was I was asking what are your instructors doing in your online program to foster your feelings of connectedness? And the second one is what would you like your instructors to do? Okay. What I'm looking for there is trying to figure out what their perception, what they think their instructors are doing to build that, that sense of connectedness and also try to get their opinion of what they feel as a student, what would they like to see their instructors do. Okay. And then finally, I just collected the demographic questions that I outlined earlier. Okay. All right, um, once I was done cleaning all the data and analyzing it, um, I ran de descriptive statistics on each scale item. Okay. Ran on demographics and open-ended question one because it was a checklist there. I could run descriptives on that. On the second question, uh, for research question two, I ran independent t-tests with Bonferroni correction. I say that five times, you know, real fast. <laughs> on, on gender, academic program, and number of successful credit hours completed. I wanted to see if there were differences between uh, you know, the, the different uh, genders and programs and stuff with their responses, okay? So for example, would, would, would there be a significant difference between male responses and female responses, okay, for example? And then uh, three and four, those were open-ended questions, so what I did there basically is I coded their responses based on different categories of, of and finding uh, common themes depending on what what the responses were from the students. Yeah. A lot of responses were, were fairly similar. Ended up with 106 valid responses after I did uh, outlier removal and a couple of people who had other for their, for their program. So I was like, well, if you're not an MBA and MSO, I'm a student, I can't use your, <laughs> your, uh, <laughs> your response. So I had to throw those ones out. Um, you can see that it was Pretty even with males and females, 53.8% of the responses were male and 46.2% were female. So that was pretty even. And that, looking at the demographics data on, on students enrolled, uh, that was pretty similar to what we have uh, in, with gender differences as well. The age range was uh, youngest student was 21, oldest student was 60. Most people were in their early 30s. Yeah, you responded. Again, that's, that's pretty typical of, of, our, of the students enrolled in our program or in their late 20s, early 30s, usually. And then um, a, a majority of the people who responded were second year students. I was kind of surprised by that. I thought I'd have an even mix, but I didn't. 65% uh, of the respondents were, were in their second year. And a uh, majority of them were MBA students at seven, almost 78%. Uh, not surprising. Um, they're, they tend to be a little more communicative because the MSOM is split up between three different colleges versus the, uh, the MBA is here. All right, um, so for discussion question one, <clears throat> overall scale items with, uh, three point, with a mean of 3.6 indicated that uh, students felt moderately connected. And that is, it's not a bad score, it's not exceptional. So I would say it's, you know, it's pretty moderate, it's, it's pretty average. If, if other studies that were conducted at, mainly at the undergraduate level, uh, community college and uh, four-year bachelors, very similar finding. 
Okay, about a 3.6 to out of five. You know. So the community uh, subscale was low. That was one where students generally indicated they did not feel connected to their programs in terms of community. Okay, uh, again, that is similar to other other studies, maybe a little lower, but nothing. I mean, it's not like we had a a one out of five. We're like, okay, well, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> okay, so it was a little low, but uh, not out of the ordinary for for other studies of this type. So uh, there were a few different items on the scale items that were under 2.5, which might be points of concern to look at. And um, one of the things that I found from feedback from open-ended questions indicated that students didn't feel like they were emotionally connected to other people and that they didn't spend a whole lot of time with their online course peers. Again, if you look at other studies of this type, that's not totally out of the norm. Okay? That, that is an inherent issue with online learning where students don't spend a lot of um, time outside the course with their peers like you see in the face-to-face -face, uh, programs, you know, like study sessions, group study, uh, hanging out with your friends before class, things like that. We just don't see a lot of that in the online program. Programs in general in college, and that might be why we're seeing some of that in, uh, with the lower in the community. And um, item 26 was asking how important is connectedness to students. I thought it was pretty neat that um, they generally found it important. That was actually a little bit higher than previous studies. So, and I, can't, I don't have any like, data to back up this statement or whatever, but it, my feeling was as, as somebody who has an MBA, you know, you're in mine online, um, I found that, that it was important in grad school, more so even than my undergrad, because I was working with a team of people, a lot of them were working full time and had different perspectives on business problems we were trying to solve in our classes. And I felt that that was pretty important to have those connection points with other students, other high performing students. So, all right. So these are the, the, the basically the descriptive statistics uh, for my um, different subscales. And you can see like students with a mean score of 4.12 felt very comfortable in their online learning environment. Okay, that's actually higher than average. So I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> uh, they felt, again, the community was a little low. Facilitation and interaction and collaboration were just fine. You know, 3.6, 3.7, um, not bad at all. And then, again, you'll see the overall score here of 3.63, uh, which isn't bad. Here are the, um, the descriptive statistics for items 10, 12, and 13. These are the three scale items that uh, were kind of a point of concern in this, stu in this study. Uh, they were a little lower than, than what you would see in, in other studies of this type. And so they didn't, <clears throat> the, the score on 10 at 2.4 was basically stating that students disagreed uh, in general that they felt emotionally attached to other students. It, and then 2.2, uh, the score for item 12, they felt like they didn't spend a whole lot of time with their course peers. And uh, item 13, they tended to disagree that they got to know their um, peers quite well in their online courses. Okay. So there might be some things that we can do in our programs, in our courses to, you know, to maybe bump up these community numbers a little bit, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to find out from students what activities are their instructors currently using in their online courses to, to improve uh, connectedness. Okay. And what I found was uh, with polling is that most of the participants indicated that their instructors use announcements, icebreakers, discussion forums, and group projects. Okay. Those are typical activities in online programs and online courses. Um, nothing out of the norm there, but these have been kind of tried and true <laughs> strategies that we've used for 20 years in, in online learning. And then to a lesser extent, some uh, students reported that their instructors used small group discussions where they would break the students out into these subgroups of four to five students and have their own discussions in that manner. Um, resource sharing, like building a, building a document together, building a wiki or sharing resources that they find on the, found on the internet. 
and online office hours for the instructors were available in an online format to assist the distance students uh, in real time with you know, Skype or some other sort of technology. All right. What I'm going to look at with question two was how do learners' responses differ based on their individual characteristics? Okay. Looking at age, gender, program, and how many hours they completed. Okay. Again, with this, I did independent t-tests on gender, um, number of hours completed in academic program, and then I did a one-way ANOVA for age, okay. because we had multiple groups. And with t-tests, we're only comparing two groups. With the ANOVA, we're comparing multiple groups, because I had five different age groups that I was comparing. OK. Um, I didn't find that many statistically significant differences between uh, groups. But I did find that gender um, on item 12, basically males reported that they spent more time with course peers than females, which I found that kind of like a little different, a little not strange, but and just a little unusual, I guess, because typically what we see in online courses is that females tend to participate more in a group setting than males do. Okay. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. And it was a significant score. You can see that both scores were low. <laughs> but uh, men had a mean score of 2.39. And uh, with females, it was 2. So that's actually a pretty significant difference. And then um, I also found uh, that second-year second students had um, statistically um, significant higher scores than first year students on items 3, 4, 5, 21, 24, which I'll pop up here in a second. And, uh, but most of those, after running a Cohen's D on this analysis, they didn't show any sort of real world um, practical significance except for item 5. So I don't know if it, it, it depends on how nitpicky you want to get with the analysis. They may, yes, there's significant differences. But you know, the real practical application of it, maybe they're not so significant. Okay. And these are the items 3, 4, 5, 21, and 24. So <clears throat> again, uh, for second year students, we're more comfortable asking for help other, from other students. That makes sense, because you, you know, you're in a, if, if you've already been taking these courses, you're more comfortable with how they're laid out, how they work. You've probably already interacted with uh, some of these students in your courses in your second year. You've already had some time with them your first year, so you're probably more comfortable with them. I know there was a set when I was going through, uh, there were like four or five people in each of those classes that we were in the same classes together all the way through. I knew them pretty well, and, and so I felt comfortable with asking them for assistance if I needed it. Um, second year students uh, definitely feel more comfortable with expressing their opinions than first year students. Again, it's probably due to more of the comfort of being in these courses, uh, you know, already having taken a full year's worth of courses in the second year, you'd be more, you know, you're kind of like the, the senior student, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, number five, which was the one that felt, which the one that showed a, kind of a practical significance, your second year students definitely felt more comfortable uh, introducing themselves in online courses than, than first year students. Uh, and then 21 and 24, uh, second year students, again, were more comfortable with working with others in their online courses. And then the last one was uh, discussing their ideas with other students in their online courses. Second year students were also more comfortable doing that. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, basically, it's, it's, if you look at the scores, everybody's pretty comfortable in these areas. It's just your second year people that may be a little more, a little more comfortable. Okay. Um, I ran uh, independent t-tests, indicated no sign statistically significant differences between gender and academic programs. I just didn't really find any. The, the score was so close, it was almost like they were almost identical. Okay. And um, I didn't show any uh, statistically significant differences on scale items between age groups either. There's nothing there. Everybody, the scores are pretty similar across the board for, for age groups. Now, there was only one 60-year-old in that last age group. So um, you know, I didn't have multiple people in that group to, to, uh, 
to analyze, but I did look at that person's scores individually and then compared them, and, and there really wasn't anything significantly different. Okay, last one uh, for discussion, or, or the question three was, I was looking at what are their perceptions regarding their instructors integrating activities in their courses to foster connectedness, okay? Um, the students mainly talked about that their, their instructors use discussion forums, they use uh, team projects, they had people do introductions, icebreakers, they, that their instructors promoted interaction, in other words, they were actively involved in the courses, trying to get people to, uh, to communicate with each other, to foster ideas, things like that. So instead of, let's say you have a discussion forum, the instructor would go in, prompt with a question, and then come back and provide feedback to student responses. That was very common. And finally, that instructors are responsive to student needs. If the student emailed the instructor, they got back to them within a, certain, within a short period of time to help them with, address whatever questions they might have. Okay. okay. And this is just the percentage of students that, number of uh, students that, with these different uh, categories for responses. You can see that most people said that, that instructors use their discussion forums and um, team projects. And then fewer students indicated that the instructors are responsive to their needs. I think that's just because it's just categorized. It doesn't mean that instructors aren't responsive. That's something I did want to clarify on this slide. It's just that seven people indicated directly that instructors were responsive to their needs. That's something that came up in my defense. You're like, so you're saying, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> no, they're, they're responsive. They're, nobody complained about that, really. Um, and then the last question that I had for, for my research questions was, um, what would students like their instructors to do? Uh, this was kind of a tricky question because it's, it, you're assuming that the students know <laughs> what they'd like to, to do. So, uh, but we got some good ideas from students, I think. Um, most students desired more frequent and timely interaction with their instructors. Now, that is so subjective it's not even funny because for some students, it might be, okay, if my instructor gets back to me in a couple of days, I'm good. Other students, literally, I, I hit send, and if you're not back to me within an hour, I'm complaining, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and those are the two extremes, right? Uh, so that's a little subjective, but from what I could take from the responses would be that most of them just said, hey, if I, in, if I email my instructor, I, one of the things that's very important to me is that they get back to me within a couple of days or a day, okay? Um, which I think is, is pretty reasonable. Um, to a lesser extent, some students wanted synchronous methods of, of learning and communication. They wanted like an online classroom where they would log in at, after they got home at work and meet up with their other students and, and you know, do activities and things like that. Which is, there are some programs that uh, do that, but most don't because of, because of the um, asynchronous nature of online learning. You have people working nights, you have people working days, you have people that are out on a you know, on a, on a ship <laughs> that, you know, they might not have reliable internet access at all times. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of mili current uh, military people who are stationed overseas taking classes, so the synchronous communication might not be something that is going to be common. Okay? Uh, students did indicate that they wanted more feedback on their assignments and timely feedback. If they submitted an assignment um, on Sunday, they would expect that by you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, they would have uh, their assignment returned with a score and with feedback from the instructor on how they might improve their assignments. That was very, there were quite a few responses that indicated that, um, that they would like more of that from their instructors. And uh, I had 10 respondents that reported that connectedness is not important or necessary. Uh, I did have a student who um, basically stated, hey, I'm just here to get my degree. I want to go in, I want to, actually there's more than one student, there were several of them, that the common consensus there was, this isn't important. What's important to me is getting into these classes, doing my homework, getting my grade, getting my diploma, getting my raise at work. <laughs> Which I, I can appreciate that, you know. When I was going through in my MBA, I was running a business at that time, and uh, I was maybe more in that camp of, on some things, I'm like, look, I don't want to sit here and do five form replies, you know, on this. I just want to go take the exam so I can graduate, you know. But uh, 
but as somebody who's several years out from that, I, I do appreciate the, the, the level of community and level of communication that we, were, that we were expected to engage in. I think I did take a lot away from it. So the implications from this study were primarily is that um, the interest of parties at the study site, faculty, administration, um, you know, staff, students, whoever's interested in this study, they now have more insight into connect in levels in their MBA and MSOM. And what we found was, we're not doing too bad. We're, we're, we're tracking right along with other studies. Maybe there are a couple things that we can improve on, but I didn't find anything that was super glaring, uh, this you know, major problem that we had to address right away. Um, the thing is that we did find that the uh, indicated low sense of community, but that's very similar to other studies. Okay. We might have to follow this up with some other studies to determine why those scores were so low. That's something that, that you know, I'd be willing to work with others on to, to determine that. And um, we might have to <clears throat> do further study of specific courses and programs. Might need to see if there are um, changes needed to some courses to improve a sense of community. I don't know. We'd have to uh, look into it a little bit more and determine what the causes are, or maybe what courses are affected, and or maybe come up with a certain way of saying, okay, in our courses, in general, we'll we'll do these things to improve community and then implement it. That's something. That's another thing we might be able to do. Um, one of the things that I thought would be kind of neat with this study was to use the framework and the instrument to. Um, replicate this study in other academic programs. We have a few other academic programs here that are online, and the, the faculty in those programs might be interested in running a similar study to see how their students feel about connectedness. Do, 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 do. All right, so there are a few recommendations that I have. Um, it's it's kind of it's actually, it's actually fairly simple, the recommendations are, because we didn't find any major glaring problems, I guess, with the, with the level of connectedness other than that lower uh, community subscore. But one of the things that uh, the literature tells us on this particular topic is that students really like meaningful feedback on any assigned work. Okay? even more so than a score. Some of them just want the score, they don't care, they just want to get their paper, their degree, and move on with life. But most students aren't that way. Most students say they want to know what they did right, what they did wrong, where, where they can improve, and so next time they can turn in a better paper or a better assignment or, or whatever. Um, so that's important. We want to make sure that we're providing, that instructors are providing meaningful feedback, and I would add timely onto that as well. It really doesn't help a student if the instructor doesn't get their uh, assignments turned back until four or five weeks after they've been turned in. By that time, if closing the loop on feedback, it's pretty much over at that point. It's not nearly as meaningful, it's not as rich. And it doesn't help that student to improve as they uh, go along. I did have, uh, w during my college studies, I did have an instructor that didn't turn anything back until the, until the course was over. You know, still have choice words for that instructor. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's 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 an issue, and that's something I think in higher ed we need to really make sure that we're providing that timely feedback, and meaningful too, not just good job. You know, tell them, get a little more deeper than that. Um, we want to engage students in courses. Okay? Again, one of the big things with online programs and online courses is that there's a, it's real easy to become isolated as a student in those courses if you're not. If you're not engaging with your instructor, you're not engaging with other students. Okay? And it's a two-way street. The engagement, not just the student engaging the instructor, the student engaging the, the, um, the, their, their classmates. It, it also needs to be the instructor maybe prompting the students to, to engage in the course. Or if you see somebody that's maybe not doing so well, engage that student individually. How can I help? You know, there's some of that, that that's very critical, I think, in, in online online courses. Um, one of the things that you can, you can do is create a, a community-based environment outside of class, Have, you know, like a Facebook group or an a, a email list or online synchronous study sessions that you, maybe you do two or three of them a week, student-led, okay, where they go in and can communicate with each other outside of class but in a virtual environment. 
just like what you would have, if you ever walked through the math and science building, you see students kind of huddled up at the table studying okay, in a face-to-face in -face format. This would be similar, but in an online uh, format. Okay? Uh, at the beginning of courses, instructors should set clear expectations of what they expect from students and uh, of, of both performance and communication. Okay? So because it's in the online area, it's not only, if you want a rich course, it's not only making sure they're performing well in assignments, but they're also performing well in communicating with each other and with yourself. Okay? Like discussion forums, for example. You, a good idea would be to have a, a minimum number of posts that they have to do per week, when their first post needs to be made, maybe a word count, maybe a, a, a detailed rubric of what meaningful <laughs> posts are, <laughs> and then a point value assigned to it to give it some teeth to make sure that they are uh, participating. And then uh, one of the things that, <laughs> that, that literature um, talks about a little bit is involving distance learners in campus events. That's something that most colleges, they're not very good at doing that yet. It's getting better, and I think one of the reasons why is because the technology is improving to where uh, you know, you can watch graduation if you can't make it, you know, uh, for example. It wasn't, a, wasn't realistic 20 years ago to do that. Well, now it is because we have all these wonderful video conferencing uh, systems and fast internet access and things like that that make it available. But uh, one of the things that online programs don't offer nearly as much as the, the on-campus experience are all the events that happen outside the classroom. Okay, so, you're, so that's something that um, there's some burgeoning research <laughs> that talks about um, involving distance learners in campus events. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the final slides here is limitations. There were some limits, limitations to this study. One is the sample size was small. There's only one school and less, uh, just under 300 uh, potential participants. Okay. Ideally, we would have, we would have uh, looked at multiple schools and had more participants, but I didn't want to go there. <laughs> I figured we could, if we ever replicate the study, we can do it there, but I just wanted to you know, get the degree, <laughs> I guess. You know, it, it just would, it would have been untenable for a dissertation, probably. It would have taken years and years and years to, to pull all that off. So the sample size was kind of small. Um, we only looked at two programs. We could have looked at more. Um, with the college system, there are three campuses. Two of the campuses have MBA programs, and all three have MSOM. Okay. So again, if we were to replicate the study, we could easily roll it out to different colleges. The geographic area is small, so most of the learners in the, in the MBA and MSOM live in the area around here. They live in Nebraska and surrounding states, and then we have them peppered nationally and a few international students. Um, the, uh, one of the things, and I think this was kind of a weakness in the question that I asked, the way that I formatted my questions for open-ended questions, were uh, most of the responses were based around tool usage. When I'm asking, like, what do your instructors do to, to foster connectedness? A lot of them, and especially when the question right before that was, what activities are they doing? Some people, I think they, they took that as to what, how are my instructors using these tools, or they were just rehashing what tools their instructors were using. So there's some of that, I think, was, was kind of a limitation. Um, and then the final limitation is that it was relied on self-reported data. Most surveys are, you know, so. But one of the things that the, I had to back up my, <laughs> my uh, limitation with, with literature and uh, uh, what I found is that if you look at literature on self-reported data, m most people will give you honest responses. Okay. I'm not making the student fill out the survey, so everything was, um, was voluntary. Okay. And it was, uh, every, all the responses were kept confidential. I don't even know who, who participated. I had one of the office assistants uh, do the random drawing, so. Uh, future research, I think, one of the things we can do is, um, again, follow up to see why the community subscale was so low. Uh, you know, some of the open-ended questions provided some insight, but I think we might want to look into that community issue in a little more detail. Okay. 
Um, one of the things that I, I did is I ran a one-way ANOVA uh, on income level and scale items. I kept it out of my study because it wasn't part of, of what I was looking at specifically. But um, I did notice that the lower the income level of the student was, is the lower their perception of connectedness was too. So that might be something to look at in the future. Um, so if it's, a, if it's a student making less than $10,000 a year, most of them don't feel very comfortable with technology and they didn't feel very connected to their courses versus somebody who is making 30,000 or more. And I thought that was interesting. Might, but that's a whole study on its own <laughs> to looking at that. And then uh, finally, we can replicate these studies in other academic programs. It's real easy to roll it out and replicate it because there's nothing uh, in this study that is specific to a business program. You can run this in an education program, you can run it in a counseling program with the same exact question scales and everything. Okay. The only thing you'd have to do is change your program name. So instead of MBA and MSOM, it'd be education and whatever you wanted to look at. Okay. I just looked at two because it was real easy for me to get the, I knew the students, I knew the, the, the programs, very familiar with them and it was, uh, it was, I shouldn't say easy to access to the students, but I, I guess kind of, you know, that was part of it. And the other thing for me is I was very familiar with those programs, so it, I knew, um, I was very interested in, in finding out where we were at uh, with, in terms of connectedness in those programs specifically. Yes, sir? I have one question. Yeah. Jennifer and I have a book <clears throat> about introverts. Yeah. I forget the name of it. But I was wondering if mostly the introverted students would rather be online, whereas extroverted students like the face-to-face -face social. Is uh, that another whole study? That, that's definitely a, a, a whole study. And it's actually, if we're looking at introversion, extroversion, and connectedness, they're, the, the uh, literature on that topic is very limited. I don't even know of any I don't even know of any, any studies that have been done on that. That's, so if there's a instructional technology grad student viewing this video, then I found a topic for you. Well, you, you can think, you know, normally <laughs> introverted students in a face-to-face -face class yeah. don't want to ask a question, but yeah. online, would they feel more comfortable? Yes. You know, extroverts, you think, I want to be in a face-to-face -face class. Yeah. Typically, yes, uh, students that are more introverted or introspective, um, quiet students, I guess you would, you would call them. They're much more likely to, to, to be involved with, with uh, discussion forums and things like that online versus in the last questions of the instructor or of other people versus in face-to-face -face format, they may not raise their hand because they would feel you know, uncomfortable and overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, and I know in my long time ago that we went to University of Wyoming and uh, <clears throat> the students that were studying and knew the course did all the talking, and the introverted uh -huh. students sat back there take notes yeah. and get higher scores. <laughs> that's the way to do it. <laughs> so, but, but I don't know online. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there have been some studies in online programs with, with uh, introverts and extroverts, but I haven't. I haven't delved deeply into that area. Yeah. Do you remember the name of that book, Jennifer? That you could let him go sometimes. It was written by a lady, and it was a New York Times, I guess. And okay. she was an introvert, and her main objective in the book was to show that introverted people should get more credit. <laughs> Next we're going to take over, you know, the outgoing salesman type. Yeah. Do all the talking, the introverts sitting back there, you know, no interaction. Yeah. So it was an intriguing book, um, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really talking about online program. Sure. I think it was just talking about the old tradition. Okay. Yeah. And what, it, yeah. And one of the things you can do, like in group projects, even if you have people that are fairly introverted, uh, face both in face to face and online format. Um, you know, they may, they may not want to be the the public face of their team, yeah. but maybe they would be more likely to do some of the the editing yeah. or research. And uh, they're in a group. They have 
Yeah. 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 So you have like your team leader, and you have their team speaker, and then you you would have some of the the other students in that in that team that maybe fulfill some other roles. I can and I can get that. I mean, some people are uh, very extra or very extroverted, where you just can't. You know, you're like, okay, you can stop talking now, and then <laughs> and then you have other people that. You know, you're you're just not going to get them to to ask questions in class. They just won't. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. But unfortunately, it wasn't really part of my study. But it is interesting. Yeah. We, we have to read this book. Did we get that from our daughter? Yeah, I think it's yeah. called Quiet. Yeah. yeah, the book was called Quiet. But okay. Was her name? I can't remember the author. But maybe Jennifer Brain did. Okay. Yeah, that'd be it's great. A fascinating book to read. Sounds good. No. Um, I was just wondering if some of the differences that you saw between males and females were differences of definitions. You know, if I say I want to spend, you know, my if I say uh, my classmates know me very well, yeah. uh, that males may feel that with the casual connection that that's that's true, but if females may feel that they really need much more interaction in order for that to be so. They very well could have. Between the actual interaction, but the difference between the perception and the interaction. It, it could have been because the, the instrument didn't indicate when, it, when you're asking the question. It doesn't ask like how many, how many connection points or how many hours would you like to spend to get to know people. It wasn't, it was just like, are we meeting your needs and are you comfortable with the amount of interaction you're having with your peers? You know. In the amount that they uh, I don't think it was significant. The only significant things that I found were, um, let me pull it up here. Gender was on item 12, and it was just that males reported spending more time with their course peers than, 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 than females. So with that question, though, I mean, that could be like, OK, you know, um, do I spend a lot of time? What does that mean? Because for me, a little bit of time is fine with me is spending with course peers when I'm going through. Because I'm busy, I'm trying to do 50 other things. But I could see where maybe somebody else, their, their idea of spending quality time with course peers is a couple of hours a week. You know, uh, So it's, it's somewhat subjective. Yeah. But most of those questions are on any survey like that, because you're, you're getting their opinion. You know, I'm not asking them, how many hours per week are you spending with course peers? Is a graduate study versus an undergraduate study because graduate students, I can say, they've got their own lives. Undergraduate, yeah. they might be more. Yeah. Graduate traditionally, undergraduates might be more. Yeah. Need of, of a, a more structured community. Yep. And most of these, most of the people in, in our MBA work full time. You know, or at least half time. You know, but a lot of these, a lot of these people, they're in their mid 30s. They already have a career. And they're looking either to advance in their career, develop new skill sets. So a lot of them are uh, definitely in the uh, get in, do the work, get the degree, move on. Uh, so they're, they're, they're pretty serious and they're kind of compartmentalizing their time more so than, say, an undergrad where they, they're taking 15 credit hours and maybe working a part-time job. Yeah. All right. Well, oh, Christy. Um, so, like... I know you collected some data on what tools professors use mm -hmm. to like facilitate connectedness. Yeah. Were you able to get students' perceptions of whether those tools were effective? A little bit. You. Words are effective, or ways they could be used more effectively. Okay. Enhance connectedness. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I didn't specifically ask like how effective the tools being used were. But that's something that if we were to do a follow-up study, I, I, I may have thrown that in as a third open-ended question. I thought about that one, Some, something similar to what you asked. Uh, quite freak, you know, thought about it quite a bit. Um, you know, I've had some responses that were along the lines of, "Well, these discussion forums are dumb," <laughs> you know, or, or uh, I really like discussion forums because it makes me log into the course multiple times a week and visit with people. You know, uh, and, and, and responses anywhere in between there. Uh, but uh, there wasn't really, I didn't have a, an open-ended question that said, are the tools your instructors 
the, you know, the tools that your instructors are utilizing, how effective is that at, at uh, improving your perception of connectedness in the course, or why is it effective? I, I didn't a a ask that, and that's probably something I should have. Uh, but the other thing, you, you don't want them having survey fatigue, <laughs> where they have you know, a million questions you're asking, so I had to really pare it down to the essentials. Yes, ma'am. Sean? In all the data that you collected, was there anything that really stuck out as a surprise? Something that surprised me was the age, uh -huh. the average age. I thought it would be much younger. Because you see so many, particularly in business, the students graduate and go right into their the MBA program. That surprised me. And a question that you also asked was the income. Yeah. I, I didn't, uh, right when I saw that, I thought, what would that have to do with anything? But then you did see a significant correlation between higher income versus lower income yeah. on connection. Yeah, and income actually wasn't even part of the study. I was curious, so I threw it in there <laughs> as a demographic question. And then when I found out there were significant differences in income levels with their comfort with, with technology and their, um, their comfort in their courses, I thought, well, that's really strange. And so if I were to do this again, I would ask a question related to, I would specifically see if I could instead of having an anonymous survey, or confidential, I guess, because there was a way where I could identify students, potentially, uh, but only if I had the list of, of the students who registered for, the, uh, for the, the, the gift card drawing. But I have no way to contact those students that were in the lower income brackets, or any of the income brackets. So with this study, I wouldn't be able to do it with these students because I don't have any identifying information specifically of who they are. So if I ran the study again, I would try to have an identification marker in there basically saying your, your, your results will be kept confidential, but I'd really like a way to contact you if I have follow-up questions. So identify those students that are in lower incomes and then develop a, or pull an instrument if one exists for, for surveying low-income students with comfort with technology, um, and then uh, do a follow-up study. Because that's very interesting. And what you might see is if they're um, from a lower-income bracket, they may not have the, uh, they may not, may not have had the um, exposure to technology or the, the use of it in school or, uh, you know, I mean, if you're making $10,000 a year or less, it's probably, you know, buying a brand new Mac probably isn't a high on your priority list of things you need to purchase, you know, so uh, that, that could be part of it. But it's, it's one of those things where I didn't address it because it wasn't part of the study, but I went ahead and analyzed the information anyways. <laughs> I found some interesting findings that I would like to follow up on at some point. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was going to ask the same question about uh, income, yeah. and you elaborated on that. But uh, I recently heard that, or read that the, in California, the university system, like Berkeley and Southern Cal, the income of the parents was almost double that of the students in their state college system sure. then the community college system parents was even lower. And yeah. I suppose it's basically, I don't know, I haven't looked further, whether it's, whether one system, well I assume the community colleges are a lot less cost, maybe it's simply what they can afford. That would be my guess. I mean, uh, you know, I look at college costs for my own children. I don't have the kind of finances that, that I can send them off to a prestigious private and bankroll it, you know, without them having to take on massive loans. So when we're looking at colleges, we're looking at the state college system, you know, maybe even encouraging them to go to the community college system for their for the first two years potentially, and then transferring those credits to a state school where their tuition's reasonable, especially with the you know, if you look at the price nationwide of tuition, the increases, it, you know, it would make sense to me that, that Again, I haven't really researched it either with the income piece, but it would make sense to me that if you had somebody that, say, you know, had a had a very high income, that they would have the opportunity to pay for their uh, their 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 child's education at a very expensive university, versus if you have a couple of working parents making, you know, fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year, if they're bankrolling the education of their child, they they you know, it's a, a big prestigious private might not be something that's, that they can afford. Uh, that makes sense, but 
yeah, I didn't, that wasn't part of my study, but that is, that it definitely is fascinating though. Yeah. Yes, ma'am? I feel like you should know this, and I might have misunderstood you, but okay. if you get an MSOM here, uh -huh. you're taking classes from Wayne for AMS? You can, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, that, the MSOM is a Master of Science in Organizational Management. So it's a little bit, it's kind of like the MBA, but it has a different focus area in, in different areas that you can explore. Um, and that, that. through it with just taking classes at CSC? I think so, yeah. Now you can, yeah. I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. But you can also take, it depends on your, on your focus here because they have a lot of shared courses in the core. So, but yeah, you can do an MSOM completely here. A lot of students do. And that's probably why, you know, 20% of them were, the responses were MSOM. Those are students here at the college that I pulled, not students at, Again, I didn't look at the MSOM specific programs at Peru or Wayne. They, now, I, I probably had some students who have taken that, that, that uh, participated here. They very may, may well have taken some courses at Wayne and Peru with their, uh, in their MSOM, but, but they're Shadron students. Yeah, out of that 273 that were pulled, those were all Shadron students. Okay, thanks. Yep. For the, uh, the courses in the MSOM, mm -hmm. Are they academically easier? I don't think so. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, if you look at the differences in the MSOM and MBA, the MBA is focused on some you know, master's in business administration. It's uh, operating existing business or maybe starting a new one. Um, but it's, it's, you're looking at kind of the, the, uh, you know, the accounting, the, the management, the marketing, um, and econ. And in MSOM, we're, it's, it's, you can branch out into several different areas so of study. Cool. Very much so, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the our MBA is what, they, what we would call a generalist MBA. So we don't have like a focus in finance or focus in accounting right now, but um, yeah. But the MSOM, we have several different options that they can choose to specialize in. Yeah, so it's just different than, it's just a different focus. But as far as the rigor of, of the courses, I would, I mean, we have to meet standards for our accreditation purposes and all that, so, yeah. But you might find somebody that wants to go into, you know, sports management or something like that. Nice. They're, yeah, they're gonna wanna take the classes in sports management that are focused in their area, and that's the, that would be the, the major difference. Yeah, versus just a generalist MBA where, you know, we're focusing on business instead yeah. of yeah. sports business. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, sir? Early on, you mentioned the formal and informal education. Part. Yeah. What types of informal learning occur in the online environment? Well, it's definitely more geared towards formal learning, but uh, some of the informal learning might be, you know, learning how to communicate properly with your peers. Yeah, in other words, if you're coming in on a Sunday night at 1150, you're like, oh man, I didn't do my discussions this week. I better hurry up and tell everybody they did a good job on their postings, you know. Uh, you, what you might find out quickly, both from formal learning with your score and informal learning with the, just a total lack of, of communication with your peers. Did you talk about the informal learning that occurs? Not much, no. When I, was, when I was building out the framework for my dissertation in my literature review, I had to read a bunch about informal learning, but most of it was related to these are the general th things of like lifelong learning. Like, you know, a prime example of informal learning would be, you know, touching a hot stove. You'll only do that once on purpose. <laughs> or, on a, or, you know, you'll only do it once, hopefully, because you're gonna learn from that, uh, that experience that stoves are hot, you know. But so in an online format, you might learn that while well, not doing my assignment on time, might, I might earn an F. But that would also be part of formal learning as well. So, but uh, yeah, there's some, probably some informal learning that goes on in the online format. But I think so too. When we look at informal learning in the online environment, it might be look, looking at creative projects. Like, okay, you're going to develop your own project and see it through to completion. And there might be some learning that goes on, like developing better study skills, study habits, uh, uh, picking a project or a, a topic that's appropriate to the class that you're taking, the course that you're taking, and, and the time scale that you have to complete it in, and the resources you have available to you. 
you learn that pretty quick when you're taking graduate studies, you know, where you're not, they always tell you don't, what do they tell you, don't, don't try to solve all the world's problems, just pick your little topic and run with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's what this was, you know, with, with my, with my uh, study. But, yeah, all right. Anyone well, else? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much.